What income is going to be required in order to purchase a home? Maybe that's a question you've been asking yourself because you want to buy a house, but you're not sure if you make enough money or you've heard that you have to make a certain amount of money in order to purchase a home. I'm going to address that and a lot more in today's video, so stay tuned. Hey, what's up everyone? This is Channing, the owner of Bayou Mortgage. And like I said, in today's video, we're going to discuss what it takes, what amount of income you're going to need in order to purchase a home. Now, from the jump, let's just let's just talk about this. There is no minimum required income to purchase a home. There is no guideline that says you must make X dollars per month to purchase a home. However, houses cost money. And so depending on the area that you live in, depending on where you're trying to purchase a home and what price of home you're trying to buy, you will need income to qualify for that amount. And so if you're if you're buying in like let's say a rural area and you can find $100,000 houses, say somewhere like Abbeville, Louisiana, which we just because we have one there right now, um, then you're going to find that it's a little easier to find a $100,000 house there than it would be in, say, the middle of New Orleans in an area where you want to live. So it's really more about the price of the home that you need to purchase or what you can afford than it is the income you make, but you still got to make money, right? So let's break it down. Let's talk about what I mean. So when we talk about buying a house and how much you actually need to make that purchase, what we're really talking about is something called debt to income ratio. Now, there's this rule in mortgage lending. Ooh, there's a lot of rules, right? So there's a rule in mortgage lending called ability to repay. Makes sense. It means if you're going to take out a loan, you need to have the ability to repay that loan back. And there are certain rules, we call them guidelines, that you must meet in order to use that income to purchase a home. So no, if you make cash, you can't use it, right? Because you're not you're not proving the income. And that's really what the rule is about, is that the income must be deemed to continue for at least three years, and it must be provable, documented income. And we take your income and we take your monthly debt. So anything on your credit report, I'm talking credit card payments, car loan payments, loan payments, student loans, even if they're deferred, we still have to count a payment against them, all these different things. We take all of your monthly debts. Now, we're not talking about your electric bill, your car insurance, your cell phone bill, purely your debts. And we divide that into your gross monthly income, what you earn gross, either if it's you or if you're applying with a spouse or someone else. And then we come up with something called your debt to income ratio. That's going to give you a percentage. You want to stay between 45 and 50 percent of your debt to income ratio. And what I'm going to do is in the comment section or in the description section of this video, I'm going to link to an article where I've done the math for you so that you can look at it because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to try to draw on the screen. So I'm going to link an article in the description that'll break down the math because you have a front end and a back end debt to income ratio so that you can see exactly what you need to do, uh, you know, where you're going to be. But here's the thing, a general, a really good rule of thumb is no more than 30% of your take home pay, right? Your monthly budget for your mortgage payment should be no more than 30% of your take home pay. 25 to 30% is going to put you in a pretty good spot typically so that you're not house poor. What that means is you can't go out and buy a house or you can't go out and do anything fun because you bought a house and all you do is work to pay your mortgage and now you're you're mad that you bought a house, right? So don't put yourself in that position. Great rule. Don't allow it to exceed about 30% of your take home pay every month or if it's you and a spouse both of your take home pay you get the idea right so let's talk about the different types of income because inevitably if we're going to talk about it we need to talk about the fact that not all incomes are created the same and I, this is especially important if you're a self-employed or work commission or you're like a plant worker and you get a lot of overtime you want to stay tuned to this because you need to hear what i'm going to say but let's break down everything as it is, right? So you've got a couple of different types of income. The first one let's talk about because it's the easiest is salary. If you are a salary employee and you get a base salary and it doesn't matter how many hours you work, that's what you're paid, right? Your, your payroll says salary. We can use your salary and there's not really any kind of crazy calculations that need to take place because your company is stating like you make this amount of money no matter what, basically. So salary is the easiest. If you're salary, we just use your salary. However, the next one is hourly. So you're an hourly employee. This means that you are paid by the amount of hours that you work, which means your income isn't guaranteed. So you could work 40 hours this week and 38 the next. Your income is variable. Your income, you know, most people that work hourly are going to work 40 hours or 80 hours every two weeks. But because your income is hourly, 
<laughs> hourly. <laughs> um, we can't just use your hourly pay and say that's what you make, right? We can't just take your hourly pay and turn that into a yearly figure. We actually have to look at the income that you're earning. And so what nine times out of 10, what an underwriter is going to do is they're going to look at your year to date pay. Now we're talking simply base pay. Okay. We're not talking about overtime or any commissions you may earn, you know, base pay, vacation time, that kind of thing. No double time, no overtime, no commissions, no bonuses. We're just talking base pay. Those I'm going to cover here in a second. We're going to take that year to date, and whatever it averages out to be, if it, you know, if you're buying in May, we're going to divide it by four. If you're buying at the end of May, we're going to divide it by five or June or July, whatever it goes to. We have to actually average that income because you are an hourly employee and that's the income we're going to use for your loan. Now, when it comes to part time employment, you're still hourly. But even more so now if you're part-time, especially if it's your second job and not your primary job, we're typically gonna average out that part-time income over a year or prob most likely two years. And if you don't, especially if it's a secondary employment and you don't have two years, we're not even gonna be able to use it because we have to have that two-year history to average out the part-time income. Sometimes we can get away with 12 months, but it's very few and far between. So. That's kind of the breakdown of how hourly works. And what we're looking at, that's why we're asking for your pay stubs. What we're looking at is we're looking at that year to date on your pay stubs. And we'll even get a, a document from your employer called a verification of employment that breaks down your income. And that document really helps us if you have the next type of income, which is overtime, commission, or bonus pay, right? So you're not self-employed, you're working for someone else. But if you have overtime, commission, and or bonus pay, those must be averaged for two years, which is 24 months. So what a verification of employment does is it breaks out that income between base pay, overtime, commission, and bonus. And we average overtime, commission, and bonus. Let's say you had all three. We average each of those over 24 months. So this is really important. Like we see this a lot. Of course, you know, people that make commission, but even more so like in South Louisiana, is if you're working in the plants and so you might be making on turnarounds a crazy amount of overtime but maybe you don't work for the next three months or maybe you miss three months out of the year or maybe you just don't make that much overtime for six months out of the year this is why lenders want these types of incomes average because you could be making five thousand dollars a month in overtime this month and make none next month so if you're in that line of work commission like car salesmen realtors even anyone that makes commission anyone that makes overtime anyone that's getting a bonus understand that we can't just use what you're making today we have to divide that out over 24 months in order to get the amount that the underwriter is going to allow you to use because of the ability to repay guidelines okay and then finally what i want to talk about is self-employed if you're self-employed then all of everything i said goes out the window right because you're typically not paying yourself a paycheck and even if you are you know if you're um, a c corp or something like that and you're paying yourself a pay stub every month we're not going to use that we're going to use your tax returns because you're owner of the business if you own 25 percent or more of the business and even if you don't in order to use that income we're going to use tax returns and just like the commission and overtime it's going to be averaged over the last two years so most of the stuff that we encounter is schedule c it's llc's right it's it's sole proprietors it's basic businesses you're going to file a schedule c each year and on that form when you when you send that to your tax accountant when you send that to your cpa you're writing things off so we can't use your top line revenue, right? We can't use the money you made. We have to use the money that you actually earned, which is your net income. And that's usually, I believe, on line 31 of your, of your Schedule C. But we can add some things back, specifically depreciation and mileage. If you've written those things off many times, we can add back in that depreciation, add back in that mileage. If you're a different type of business structure, so you're not a Schedule C, you have a partnership, you file K-1s, you're a C-Core or an S-Core or something like that. I don't know why I said C-Core, S-Core, S-Core. Um, we're gonna we're gonna need the business tax returns too if you're more than 25% owner. So you gotta have your personal returns, we gotta have your business returns, we gotta have the K-1s, and we have all sorts of fancy calculations we put in to determine how much you made, but at the end of the day, it pretty much comes out to whatever you made after expenses plus some add backs you know if you own rental properties or something like that we can add back in your taxes your mortgage interest you know those your insurance those types of things but 
we need the tax returns. So we can't even tell you if you're pre-approved. No lender can, right? So, so listen to me right now because we, so much heartbreak happens, so much frustration and disappointment happens because you go online and this lender tells you you're pre-approved. They don't ask you for any documentation. They, you're self-employed. You don't know because you've never done this before. You go to close on the loan. Turns out you don't make as much as you thought you did because that's what you claimed and you wrote this off. And now you can't buy the house and you're frustrated and you're mad. Avoid all that. Avoid all of that situation and work with a lender who knows what they're doing. And you can tell if they know what they're doing by the fact if they ask you for these documents up front. If you get a pre-approval and you're self-employed and you didn't provide tax returns, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're heading for danger. You need to stop. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? And turn around. Work with a lender who's got tax returns, who requires those tax returns, because they're they're going to have your best interest at heart. They're, they they want to make sure that you can buy the home, and that's what you're going to have to do to be able to do that. So those are the different types of incomes when it comes to purchasing a home. I talked a little bit about debt to income ratio. Talked a little bit about how the income stuff works because it's not just at face value. If you have any questions, drop a comment. I'd love to answer them. As always, please like this video. Please subscribe. Please comment. It helps us reach more people just like you looking to buy a home. I'm Channing, and I look forward to talking to you soon.